And we're very pleased to be joined by Paul Rykoff for the IAVA event. I was there when this thing got launched. It's amazing how much you guys have grown. And I know you're a nonpartisan group. You guys were in Cleveland uh, last week, obviously in Philly for this whole week. The issues of veterans, um, it seems that there's been a lot of traction where people, at least, it's on their radar. You can get any meeting you want in the halls of Congress. It was different than 10 years ago. But how much movement's been made, where has progress happened, and where are we still short in terms of where we need to go? I think we've come a long way in the last 12 years since I founded IVA. We've still got a long way to go. I think now what you see is a lot of great talk. You see a lot of, uh, of rhetoric. You see them holding up veterans. Veterans are the new applause sure. language, right? If you want to get everybody in the crowd cranked up, say, hey, who likes veterans, right? Everybody loves veterans. But actually getting down to brass tacks and changing things, the VA just had the biggest scandal in history two years ago. So we're you know almost 15 years into the war on terror, and there's still a long way to go. Republicans and Democrats have been using veterans as props. We need to really get real reform on VA reform, an issue that's really important, I know, to folks watching your shows. Uh, women veterans need better support. And we've got a suicide crisis. 20 veterans a day are dying. So we want to hear from someone who wants to be the commander in chief. How are you going to talk to our military? How are you going to talk to our veterans? How are you going to fix things? You know, talking tough is easy. Making real change is hard. Well, to that point here, put, put a point to it, Paul, because you're going to hear a lot of love. We all love our vets. Right. But what specific proposals are either sitting um, without gaining any traction or um, are you waiting for to at least get put to a House vote and then eventually the Senate? What do you want to see specifically happen more than the words? Well, right now, the Senate's trying to push forward $3 billion in cuts to the GI Bill. Sounds crazy. It's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard to come out of Washington, but it's real. They're trying to cut the GI Bill. We're punching back. So Hillary Clinton this week made a very strong stand on it, said stay away from the GI Bill, find money savings elsewhere. Trump has said nothing. So we want to hear him come out in front. This should be a nonpartisan issue, Rich. We've got uh, Senate Democrats and Republicans who've stepped forward, but not enough of them. We need uh, Senator Blumenthal, the ranking member uh, on the Senate side from Connecticut. We need Johnny Isaacson from Georgia. We need them both to step out in front and say, even if times are tough, you can't touch the GI Bill. That's number one. And VA reform. You know, it's easy to say you're going to change the VA, but we've got 20 22 million veterans in America, well, and they're depending people, on the VA. For people who don't get it, it seemed like they got the right guys in there. It seemed yeah. like people who cared. Why do they keep screwing it up so bad? Well, I wish I knew. I mean, it's hard, right? Changing the VA after 30 years of it really kind of sitting stagnant has been tough. There's a new injection of veterans. The World War II veterans are getting older, and Vietnam veterans can now go for Agent Orange presumption. If they were exposed to Agent Orange, they can go into the VA. So it's been a very dynamic situation. But the VA needs to innovate, it needs to evolve. It needs to be more like Amazon and less like an old Borders bookstore, right? It's really got to change, and innovation in the government is tough. So we want to hear from the Democrats this week, how would you change it? You had, you had eight years. Uh, President Obama had eight years to change the VA, and in some ways it went backward. So how is Hillary gonna, Clinton going to be different? We want to hear about that, especially for folks in the tri-state area. This is very important to us. We're headquartered in New York, so it's a very important issue for us locally, too. You know, um, what surprised me a little bit is when I heard Donald Trump speak of John McCain the way he did, so he's no real hero, he got captured. And again, with Trump's record where not one, but four deferments, he couldn't remember which foot got hurt. Right. I would have thought that that would have been more of a scarlet letter on him for among people who served. And while it certainly rubbed a lot wrong way, a lot of others have disregarded it. Yeah. Um, are you a little bit more surprised that hasn't been more damning to certain I, populations? I am. I mean, it was a disgusting comment. It was shameful. It was un-American, right, to criticize John McCain. Even if you disagree with his policy issues, he's an American hero. So so were so many of the guys and, and, and gals who, who were captured, or were captured every, time, every war since. So it was really an attack not just on John McCain, but on everybody who served, on anyone who's ever been taken prisoner in a time of war. And I think it just shows the level of discourse that, that's happening. And interestingly, John John McCain wasn't there in Cleveland last week. I've been going to the convention since 2004. John McCain not being there says a lot. So I think we're looking to hear how he's going to make up for that, but also how's he going to get down to policies? How's he going to reform the VA? How's he going to deal with the suicide crisis? You know, he said uh, this week he's going to hand out a cell phone number and everybody could call him. That sounds great, but I don't think that's going to work. He better have a lot of cell phones because there are 22 million veterans in America and a lot of them are going to be calling him. Last uh, question. Uh, in one of the tragic recent mass shootings where we lost law enforcement, I saw you comment, which is, all I saw was 26-year-old African-American veteran. And you said that in and of itself proves that we still don't get it. Yeah. What did you mean? I think it was irresponsible journalism. 
to, to just stereotype veterans as crazy, Rambo, uh, homicidal maniacs is easy, okay? It's the stereotype that existed after Vietnam, and we need to puncture that, okay? It, it's not true. Veterans are on the front lines as cops, as EMTs, as teachers. When there's a, a mass shooting, we're more likely to be the people running in to help than we are to be the shooter. Yes, the shooters in Dallas and in Baton Rouge had served in the military, but they had done a lot of other things too, and some of the cops who were killed were veterans. But you didn't see the New York Times and others leading with that story. Instead it says, vets shoot people. And that's a lazy, irresponsible way to cover it. And I think really damages the veterans community when we're trying to show that we're leaders, we're trying to change America, we're trying to get jobs. And the country's never been more disconnected. So there are a few veterans in Congress, there are a few veterans running for office, there are a few veterans in the media. So it's really important for our group and others to be out there educating people about what PTSD really is, about what kind of veterans issues we are facing, and about how people can help. We say all the time, you don't have to be a veteran to support the veterans movement. And that's what a big part of this is about for us, going to Cleveland, going to Philly, trying to get people involved, not just now, but long through the days. Well, uh, I was there, like I said, when it starts. amazing how far you guys have come thank here, you. and you're doing great work here. Paul, thank you so much. Thanks, Rich Rose. Absolutely. Having her back. We appreciate it.